Thank you so much, worship team. I wonder if we can uh, start this morning with a thought experiment. How many of y'all are up for maybe a thought experiment as we get started? Anybody? Any volunteers? All right, let's, let's try this out together, all right? Let's, let's, let's walk this out. What if you woke up this morning and you were Jesus? All right? Stay with me. What, what if you woke up this morning and you were Jesus? You still live in the same house. You have the same family. You don't look any different. You still have the same problems, all the same challenges, all the same health issues. You have the same job. Well, I'm sorry, Emmett, but you do not have hair. You have the same job. You have the same boss. You have the same coworkers. You still attend the same church. And the experience and circumstances of your life are exactly the same, except for one thing. Today, you have the mind of Christ. The heart of Jesus. His life becomes your life. Somehow, somehow, think about it. Somehow Jesus is living inside you today. How would you be different? How would you feel? How would you think? How would you live differently today? Remember, his attitude is your attitude. His humility guides your every decision. His compassion is the way that you look at others. His purpose is driving your life. His passion for people is influencing your relationships. And his love is at the heart of your actions. What would others see in your life today? Would anything look different? What would your family see? What would your friends see? What would your coworkers see? Fellow Jesus followers, the non-Christian community that's all around us, would they see a change in you, a new you, a difference in you? I wonder if Jesus living inside you would alter your activities that maybe even you had planned for today. Wait a minute, I I woke up this morning and maybe my plans aren't that important today now that I'm Jesus. What would your schedule look like, your treatment of others, your speech? How would your words maybe look different today? Your priorities, your prayer life, would anything about your life be different today if Jesus woke up inside of your heart and mind. Now, y'all know where I'm going with this, right? This, this isn't just a hypothetical. Everything that we just talked about, this isn't a hypothetical. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, Jesus is living inside of you today. When you woke up this morning, the spirit of the living God woke up with you. And he wants to have this relationship with you throughout the day. And he wants to change the way that you think and love and give and serve and look at people around you. But do we ever make that connection? Do we ever put that together? That you have everything you need today to be Jesus and to live like Jesus. Listen to 2 Peter 1.3. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly not a life. Everything you need to live this godly life is at your disposal through the power of his Holy Spirit living inside of you. This is God's plan for your life, not just to believe in him. Right? That's the first step to, to, to put our faith and trust in him as the Lord and Savior of our life. But he also wants us to become like his son, Jesus. That's his plan for your life. Listen to Romans 8, 29. From, for from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and all along he knows the ones who are going to come to him, 
What, what was his plan from the very beginning? That they should become like his son. That's my plan. I, I knew all the ones who were going to come to me in faith, and my plan for those people is that they would become like my son, Jesus. I, I love when verses that are kind of familiar to us to kind of switch it up a little bit and look at paraphrases. Let's look at how a paraphrase translates Roman 8, Romans 8.29. It says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape, to conform, to mold the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity that he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. Isn't that great? Like, if we want to know what, what this life is supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like, we have Jesus as the model, as the example. And he doesn't just leave us that way. He comes and he gives us his spirit to live inside of us, to help us live this life that he's already shown us how to live. The goal of the Christian life is to to be with Jesus every single day, to know him. That's why Jesus gave us that invitation in Luke 9, 23. If anyone wants to come after me and be my disciple, you need to be willing to what? Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Just come and follow me. Come, get, get to know me, right? Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that we know the one true God and his son Jesus whom he sent. That is eternal life, to know God, to know Jesus. And we get to know him by following him, by walking with him, by staying connected to him relationally, right? We know how important it is to stay connected to the vine. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the Branches, if you remain in me and I in you, guess what? You're going to bear much fruit. So stay connected to me. Be with Jesus. But don't just be with me. I want you to become like me. I want to let my life flow in and through you out into the world around you. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus. But then it doesn't stop there, right? As we're becoming like Jesus, then I want to actually do as Jesus did. Do live this life that Jesus lived. John reminds us, hey, if we claim to know God, if we claim to know the Savior, then our life should look like Jesus' life. We got we to gotta walk and live like Jesus did. He told us that in 1 John 2, verses 5 and 6. Do as Jesus did. See, it's not just about coming to church. It's not just about religion and rules and rituals. It's about a personal growing relationship with the risen Lord Jesus that results in us becoming like him in real life. In our real life, in our relationships, his life becomes our life. We think like him. We act like him. We love like him. So let's talk more about becoming like Jesus today. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want, like, when you wake up in the morning, is that what you want? Like, for him just to, for him to live his life in and through you. That, that's a possibility for us. Let's talk about how we can do that today. After we're born again through faith in Jesus, we actually receive a new nature, a new life. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Isn't that great news? Isn't this, isn't this the good news? The old life is gone and a brand new life has begun. See, we see a beautiful picture of that in baptism, don't we? When, when we're, we're buried in the likeness of Christ, that, that old me, that old person is left behind. We're buried with Christ and we're raised to new life. We're a new person with a fresh, clean slate to become the people that God wants us to be. New life. But here's the thing. What has happened on the inside Right? When we give our lives to Christ, we receive that new nature. What's happened on the inside isn't necessarily what others can see yet. 
right? How many of y'all new believers know that and feel that a little bit, right? Maybe our words and our actions and our thoughts haven't caught up yet. We know something is different about us. We, we just know it. We've got the spirit. We've got, we've got Jesus inside of us, but maybe I, I'm still having some struggles. Some, some things on the outside haven't caught up with what's happening on the inside yet. While you have this new nature on the inside, sadly, we still have that old sin nature, don't we? We have the flesh. It doesn't go away. Our spirit has been brought to life, but now there's a battle brewing. The fight is on with our old nature. Listen to how Paul describes it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, the sinful nature wants to do evil. All right? It wants to do evil. And so Satan is going to keep tempting us with the sinful nature. Okay? He's going to come at you just like from the, from the very beginning. You know what? God's holding out on you. Why are you, why are you trying to live this way? Why are you trying? That's not true. That's not true what you're hearing in church, what you read in the Bible. Hey, he's, he's holding out on you. If you really want to find satisfaction and fulfillment, keep looking in those old places. Keep going back to those old places. Look in those old places. That's, that's, you were just missing out the first time. Keep going there. So we look for fulfillment apart from God's promises so often. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. You see the battle already? The, the flesh and the Spirit are totally at odds. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Who, who's, who's ever been there? You have the best of intentions, right? You know the truth. You want to do what's right. You want to do what's good. And you just find yourself still doing the wrong thing. How, how can that be? I, I want to encourage you to read Paul. Paul just gives a beautiful description of this struggle in Romans chapter 7. Read that, read that sometime this week. He's like, why is it? Oh, wretched man that I am. Why do I keep doing the things that I don't want to do? And the things that I do want to do, I just I can't seem to make it happen. Why does it keep happening this way? The reality is, in this daily battle, whichever one of these things that you feed the most... That's what's going to grow. That's what's going to win, okay? Is it going to be the spirit, this new spirit that's been brought to life inside of us, or is it going to be the flesh? Flesh. Which one are we feeding? Because the one that we're feeding is the one that's going to grow and take over our life. That's why Jesus says in Luke 9.23 that we take up our cross daily, daily. We've got to be willing to deny ourselves and sacrifice, put, put to death these earthly desires that are fighting against this new spirit that God has put inside of us. What we have to learn to do is feed our spirit more than we feed our flesh. You know, every time that you give in to the flesh, every time that I give in to the flesh, I'm feeding it. Every single time, with responses, with actions, with reactions, with thoughts. Every time I give in, I'm feeding the flesh. And it grows. And if you give it something that it likes today, guess what? Tomorrow, it's going to want more of it. It's going to want more of it. It's going to want more of it. Ray kind of uh, brought something to my mind this, this Friday as we were talking. You know, it's, it's just not fair. How many of y'all just love a good green lawn? Like, you love, a, you love a green lawn. Maybe you don't have a green lawn, but you love a green lawn. It's just beautiful. You take care of it. Now, do you have to put in a lot of effort for that nice green lawn? Yes, you do. You got to work at it. You got, you got to work hard to have that green lawn. Now, here's the unfair part. Do you have to work at all for those weeds to pop up? <laughs> Neighbor, right? Right? Yeah. See, Way Wayman has got these weeds, and they, he, just, like, he has tried and tried and tried to kill these things, Man, and they just keep coming back with a vengeance. And he doesn't have to try. He does, he's not watering them and feeding them. They just, they just pop up, don't they, with no effort at all. See, that's what happens in our life. Like, the, the flesh 
Man, it doesn't take any effort. It's easy for the flesh to rise up, isn't it? But it's going to take some effort for us to really focus on the Spirit, what's most important. And as we're feeding our spirit and as we're watering our spirit, guess what? That grass starts to spread and take over those weeds in our hearts and lives. But it takes some work on our part. It takes some effort. We're in a, we're in a spiritual battle. The bullets are flying, aren't they? We, we got to be ready for it. Fight the flesh, the weeds, by feeding our spirit. Every time we say no to it, in the power of the spirit, as we trust and yield, it gets weaker and weaker in our lives. We stop giving it what it's demanding, and it's going to be uncomfortable for a while, but little by little, it has less power over us. So this idea, see, we've got to understand that spiritual maturity is not how much you know. Spiritual maturity is how much you look like Christ. Okay? That, that's a big one for a lot of us. That was a big one for me for a long time because I felt like just because I know the truth and I can say the truth and I can repeat the truth, then that makes me mature. But that's not. What, again, what do my words, my actions, my reactions, what does is, what is my everyday real life look like? Does it look like Jesus? That's where spiritual maturity is measured in our relationships. And we become more like Christ when we listen to the voice of the Spirit rather than the voice of the flesh. Now, this is important. This isn't just something that we're going to pray for and get just like that. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, right? Isn't that what we want? Don't we always, aren't we always looking for the quick fix? Just, man, give me the easiest, quickest fix I can get. Like, I don't want to eat right and exercise. I want to take maybe a pill that's going to make me lose weight. I, whatever it is, like, I don't want to do the work. I don't want to put in the work. I want, I want just a quick fix that takes care of it without any effort on my part. And we want the same a lot of times in our spiritual lives, and it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We, we, we don't find a shortcut. There's not, not anything that can instantly resolve all of our problems, remove all temptations, release us from all growing pains. Growth is gradual. Growth is gradual. It's, it's, it's going to take us the rest of our lives to become like Christ. Spiritual maturity doesn't happen overnight. All of us are works in progress. Think of it this way. We have been, here's the good news, we have been saved. We have been rescued from the penalty of sin through the power and the blood of Jesus. Rescued from the penalty of sin. Now we are being saved from the power of sin in our lives. And that's a process that's going to be happening through the rest of our lives. Here's another kind of bit of, man, I wish I didn't have to say this. We still have to go through things for growth as followers of Jesus, right? Don't we want to go around those things? Don't we just, again, I, God, I don't, I don't want to go through this. I want you to, uh, Malcolm shared something with me this morning. We're always looking for rescue or a resolution, right? We don't want to have to go through it. Save me from this. Rescue from me. Uh, pluck me out of this situation. And God's like, but here's the thing. In this situation, I'm not going to leave you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And in this situation with you, you're going to learn things about who you are and learn things about me that you're never going to learn any other way. Your faith is going to become real and your love for me is going to become real and deep in this situation. And I'm, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go through it with you. I'm not going to leave you, but you have to go through this. We all have muscles, don't we? I mean, believe it or not, underneath all of this, there, there, there are muscles. That's what they tell me. That's what the x-rays tell me. But if you don't use, if we don't use those muscles, what happens? They're never developed. They're, 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 they're weak. They're, they're never developed. In the same way, we have this new nature. It's a gift from God, but we have to grow into this new creature that God's, God says that we are. 
We have to learn to walk in our new identity, and it is a process. It takes time. Have you ever felt discouraged about your perceived lack of progress? You kind of look at your life, and you're like, man, I just don't feel like I'm making any progress at all. Do you ever get discouraged in that? Kind of where you look at where you are? That's exactly what the enemy, the accuser, wants. He, he wants to keep you discouraged. He, he wants to keep whispering in your ear, you know, there's no hope for you. you look, look at how good everybody else around you is doing. There's no hope for you. You'll never amount to much of a Christian, even if you are one. I don't even, I'm not even sure you are one. You're a slave to sin. You've tried to fight it. It's no use. You're never going to be like God. You ever had any of those? Thoughts, that discouragement, that, that's the enemy trying to keep you down. So if we want to become like Christ, here's the thing. We got to start right there where the enemy is whispering those lies to us. We got to start with our thoughts. If we want to truly become like Christ, start with your thoughts. To change your life, you have to change the way that you think. And that's a big one. Behind everything you do is a thought. Here, here's, a, here's something I read not too long ago. It says, the way that you think determines the way that you feel, and the way that you feel influences the way that you act. Right? Our emotions are actually the springboard for our actions. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think. It's a wise saying. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Another way of, of thinking about this that I read one time is your thoughts are actually the steering wheel of your life. Right? So whatever your thoughts are, that, that's, that's where you're headed. Okay? That's, that's where they're taking you. You're, that's, the thoughts are the steering wheel of your life. So we have to go to the root issue. We have to go to our minds, our thoughts, those false beliefs, and begin replacing them with God's truth. Everybody uh, look in, in your seat, uh, every other seat. We've got some of these handouts. I want us to take a look at those for just a second. This is... A, a, a good visual, I'm, I'm kind of a visual learner. I think this is a good visual representation of what we're talking about. We want to we start over in the left, on the left side of the, of the page, right? The top left for the trees. And then down at the bottom, we're looking at over at the left where it says situations. Okay, and we're, we're just following through and looking at, okay, what, what's the fruit that I'm seeing in my life? What are the thoughts that I'm having. How do, I, how do I identify those false beliefs, these, these thoughts that I'm having, the emotions that are running through me, so that I can replace them, if they're not true, with God's truth, right? That's what we're trying to do, replace false beliefs with God's truth. Now, if you'll see kind of in the middle of the page, we see repentance happening between those two trees because that first tree on the left, the fruit of our lives, we've got fear going on. We've got worry going on. We've got anxiety, desire for control. Is that the kind of fruit you want produced in your life? No. So we got to figure out where that's coming from. And once we get down to the roots, we're looking at repentance. Now, that's a churchy word, but all that means is to change our minds right? We're, we're changing our minds about what we think the truth is. That we're changing the way we think about God, about ourselves, about sin, about other people, about life, our future, and everything else. I am adopting Jesus's outlook and perspective on my life when I repent. So I'm moving from that left side over to the right side, and I'm replacing those false beliefs with God's truth. And when I do that, guess what happens? I have godly thoughts, and I have good emotions which lead to godly actions, and I see the fruit of peace and love and joy, what only the Spirit of God can produce in my life. Take some time this week, really kind of look at this and, and pray through this this week. Help, get, a, get a picture of what God wants to do in your life, and it begins with your thoughts.
Now, we're not, here's a big thing. We're not going to look at the progress of other believers as we're becoming like Christ. We're not going to compare. Don't we, we just talked about it a few weeks ago, right? The dangers of comparing with other people, what it does to us. We are working on whatever God is dealing with us about right now, okay? Stop looking around. Fix your eyes on Jesus and what he's doing in your heart and life. Next, we have to understand that life is the classroom for discipleship. When, when you think, when I say the words discipleship, what's the mental picture that immediately pops in your mind? Student. Yeah, student, probably a formal educational setting, right? I've, I, it's it's got to be a formal educational setting. Now, information and learning is crucial to becoming a disciple of Christ. We've got to know the truth. If we're going to be able to replace the false beliefs with the truth, right? We got to know the truth. But I'm telling y'all that life is where discipleship really happens. That's where we're taking the truth and putting it into action, where we apply the truth in relationships, in our actions and thoughts and responses with people around us. God works through the ordinary experiences of daily life to form the character of Christ in us. That's where he's working. So, so we got to get this idea that, okay, I come and I do my discipleship at church, but then I just go on with life once I leave. Now, that's, as soon as you leave, that's truly where discipleship starts happening. Because Jesus didn't check out when you walked out the door. Jesus is with you. His spirit is inside of you. And he's like, all right, let's go. Follow me. Deny yourself. Listen for me. Look at where I'm working. Practice love and mercy and forgiveness. I want to produce joy and hope and peace in you. You've got to listen to me. You've got to yield to me. You've got in, your cho in the choices that everything that's happening out there. That's happening out there in life. Life is the classroom. It's where we start practicing turning right answers into right responses in real life. Listen to what James says. He says, consider it a sheer gift. Consider it pure joy, friends, when the stuff of life comes at you. You feel joyful when that happens? Do you, do you feel pure joy when the stuff of life starts coming at you? No. No. James, what are you talking about? What are you even talking about? Consider it a gift. Consider it pure joy when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Like, like, hey, let me develop perseverance in you and character in you and faith in you. That's what God's trying to do. Don't try to jump ship. This is exactly where I want you. I want to produce this in you. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. See, God produces his character in me as I walk through those stressful situations, those hard circumstances, when I deal with difficult people in real life. But why does it have to be that way? I mean, honestly, why does it have to be that way? I want it to be easier. I, 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 I want it to be easier. How does God produce his fruit in your life in situations that are opposite of the fruit he's trying to grow in you? right? It, it's easy to love people who are lovable. Isn't it easy to love people who are just, oh, I just love, oh, I just love to be around that person. They're the greatest. They're so easy to love. But how about difficult people? You know how God's going to teach you to love? Sorry. He's going to put you around people who are difficult to love. That's where you get to practice. That's where you get to practice. You'll learn patience when it is tested in the opposite situation, right? When things aren't going smooth and easy. During periods of difficulty, he wants to teach you peace 
and joy. Stay with me. I'm right here with you. I'm not going to leave you, forsake you. Listen, I've got stuff you can only learn walking through this with me. So, hey, come on, yoke up with me. Learn from me. We can do this. We can do this. Our struggles and difficulties are learning and discipleship opportunities where we get to build our muscles, where we're not just listeners, right? We're not just hearers only, we're doers. That's where we actually get to do, to put it into practice. As we respond to the Spirit instead of the flesh. Now, what is God, here's the question, what do you feel like God is dealing with you about right now in your life? And what's the truth, what's the truth about that situation? And how are you going to respond? Are, are you going to yield to his spirit? See, the truth isn't passive. The truth offers you a choice. So here's the truth. Now, now what am I going to do about it? Maybe, maybe he's dealing with you about being grateful in the midst of your life problems. Or maybe he, he wants to help you eliminate anger as just the ruling emotion in your life. That's, that's the first thing that comes up inside of me when things aren't going well, right? Just, just anger so that I don't lose my temper, so that I don't seek revenge or internalize that anger so that it comes out as resentment and depression. Maybe, maybe that's what he wants to help you with right now. Or maybe it's dealing with lustful desires. Or maybe it's... I just need to learn how to love my enemies. I feel like everybody's out to get me right now. And you're telling me I'm supposed to bless those that curse me, to love my enemies, to pray for them. God, you got to help me. You got to help me do that. I don't know how to do that. Maybe it's seeking to please God and not people. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's eliminating materialism, eliminating worry, negativity, or just a critical spirit. Is that you? And, and God wants to deal with you about that. There's four types of critical spirits. A gossiper, a judgmental person, a slanderer, and a complainer. Right? Is that what God wants to deal with you about? Or about being kind and considerate, taking the initiative to do for others as you'd like for them to do for you. See, we got we to gotta decide. If we're going to be disciples, we have to decide. I'm going to respond to Jesus' invitation. Do you really want to let God deal with this in your life? That's, that's the question we have to answer. We have to decide. We have to make the decision. Yes, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for this. I'm ready to participate with your Holy Spirit. And if you're not, what's your hesitation or resistance? What's, what's keeping you? What's holding you back? We have to decide, then we have to commit. I read this one time that just really impacted me. Tell me what you're committed to, and I'll tell you who you'll be in 20 years. Tell me right now what you're committed to, and I'm going to tell you who, exactly who you're going to be in 20 years. Christ-likeness comes from making Christ-like commitments. See, there, there's, not a, there's not a shortcut. There's not any other way. If I want to become like Christ, if I want to look like Christ, I have to make Christ-like commitments in my life. Man, some, some of us talk such a big game about commitments, you know, and, and being a man and living up and keeping our word. What's your spiritual life look like? That, that, I, I see it happening in the world. But how about you walk with Christ? Are you keeping that commitment? Because that's, that's really the first one, right? If you're a disciple, that's the first one. And you might be asking, okay, I'm ready to commit. So what, what, what's there to help me to do this, right? We've, we've got to begin training to become like Jesus. Imagine, think about this. Imagine trying to run a marathon 26.2 miles without doing any training. What, what would happen? right? If you, yeah, yeah. If you just walked out the door and was like, I, I got this, you know, I, I, I've read about marathons. I know how they work, you know, I know it's 26 and you just go out and you just start running, right? It's not going to end well, is it? It's not going to, yet, yet for so many of us, that's kind of how we think the, our walk is going to be, 
right? I don't, I, I'm just trying hard. I, I'm not training. I'm just trying. And, and we just get chewed up and spit out, don't we? Because we, we, we just hit the wall so quickly. Without training, the resources simply aren't there. On the day of the race, no amount of trying will make up for the failure to train. So here's what happened. Here, here, we need a spiritual workout plan program for our lives as followers of Christ. We, it, it takes intentionality. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7. He says, train yourself in godliness. This is, this is his, this young guy that he's taken under his wing and he's like, Timothy, listen, like uh, regular exercise, going to the gym, I mean, that's good for you. But here's the best thing, train yourself in godliness. And it doesn't just happen automatically. It doesn't happen overnight. You got to keep at it. You got, you got to commit to this. Listen in 1 Timothy 4, 15. He says, practice these things. Im immerse yourself. Devote yourself. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. See, it's, it's not about perfection. It's about progress as we're training, as we're becoming like Christ in the rhythms of our everyday life. I participate with him, the Holy Spirit, to build my spiritual muscles, to let go of those. As Ray said, I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to take off the old self, right? The old thoughts, the old habits, the old routines, and I'm developing new habits. I'm putting on the new self. Again, how do I do that? Let's, let's look at a, a few helps as we're closing today. First of all, this, this is great. Learn how to practice the presence of God. There is a book I think a lot of us are familiar with, with written by Brother Lawrence, just about practicing, how, how to practice the presence of God. And it's this idea of all of life is lived in the presence of God. Didn't we learn that in Psalm 139 last week when we looked at Psalm 139? Where can we go to escape the presence of God? Where can we go? Nowhere. We, we can't escape. So rather than trying to escape the presence of God, why don't we acknowledge it and invite it in? He's always with us. He knows when we, when we stand up, when we sit down, what we're going to say, what we're thinking, what we're doing. He knows everything about us. So in the midst of all of that, we learn how to practice his presence. God, you are here with me in this. You were here with me this morning when I woke up and when I was drinking my coffee and in the car ride over here and when I was yelling at my kids because they were making us late, right? He's, he's right there with us. Acknowledge it. Invite it in. There's, there's nothing too mundane or ordinary that isn't permeated by the presence of God in our lives. We see this perfectly in Jesus, right? His priority was his connection with the Father, wasn't it? He always knew where the Father was working. He, he would only say what the Father had for him to say, only do what the Father had for him to do. That connection was so strong. He was aware of the presence of the Father. And we can do the same. We can be in worship and prayer even as we're going through our daily routines, even as we're doing dishes, even as we're changing diapers and driving and dealing with difficult people, we can allow God's presence to infuse every single moment of our lives with his peace and joy. But see, we got to practice this to get good at it. Practice his presence, realizing that he's there with us. You know, it's interesting how so many of us have come to expect God to only show up during our spiritual times, right? Our only, maybe during the sermon time or during prayer time or during my quiet time, and he does. He does show up during those times. But it's not like, okay, we had our time together. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out, right? I'm, I'm, I'm off the clock now, and you just go live your life. That, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. In the Bible, God is most often showing up in normal everyday life. Right? Moses is tending his sheep. He's just tending sheep. Gideon is threshing wheat. And the angel of the Lord shows up. Saul is on the road to Damascus. I'm, I'm just on a road trip. And Jesus shows up. 
right? The, the disciples, Peter and Andrew, we're just, we're fishing. We're just, we're just out fishing. Jesus, as he's doing ministry, as he is joining God in his mission along the way, where's this happening? At a wedding. It, when he meets Nicodemus, he's in Jerusalem in a home at night, right? I'm just in, in somebody's home. And, and it's nighttime, and boom, Jesus shows up. And he heals a paralytic in a house in Galilee. He does ministry at a well at Peter's house along the seashore in the countryside of Bethsaida by a pool on a mountain along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Do we see the pattern? Do we see the pattern? The significance of the context in these biblical events as life is happening, Jesus is aware of the Father. How? He's practicing his presence. Right? He's walking with the Father. The, this is what my life is. Every morning when he wakes up, this is my life. To do the will of the Father who sent me. How do we learn how to do that? We start practicing his presence. The key to staying in the presence of God is abiding. Is abiding. We, we know the verse from John 15, 5. We just said it a few minutes ago. Jesus said, I'm the vine you're the branches. If a person remains in me, if a person abides in me and I in him, what happens? We bear much fruit. But apart from him, what happens? We do nothing. We can do nothing. So we have to learn to abide. That word abide is a, is, is a great word. It means to remain, to stay, to, to make our home in him. I love that right? Just this idea of we're making our home in God. I'm, I'm not leaving this place. I'm making my home in him. No matter what I'm doing, as I'm doing life, I'm making my home in him. I'm living in a relational connection to Jesus by the Spirit. I'm reading a book right now uh, by John Mark Comer with a young man in our church, and uh, it's called Practicing the Way. And listen, listen to what this author writes about abiding. He says, all of us are abiding, all right? Whether we realize it or not, all of us are abiding. What are you abiding in? That's the question. What are you abiding in? Where are you making your home, your emotional home? Think about that. It's where your mind goes when you're not busy with tasks, where your feelings go when you need solace. Where your body goes when you have free time. Where your money goes after you pay the bills. Where is your emotional home? We all make this home somewhere. The question is where? And, and here's the kicker. Where we abide will determine the fruit of our lives, good or bad. So where are we abiding? Where are we abiding? If we're rooted in the infinite scroll of social media, it will form us. Likely into people who are angry, anxious, arrogant, simplistic, and distracted. Not good fruit. Where are we abiding? If we're rooted in the endless cues of our streaming platforms of choice, they will form us too, likely into people who are lustful, restless, and bored, never present to what is. Not good fruit. If we're rooted in the pursuit of hedonism, another drink, another toke, or another hookup to take the edge off the pain and let us find a moment's peace. That will form us as well, likely into people who are compulsive, addictive, and running from our pain and simultaneously our healing. Where is your emotional home where does your mind go? Where does, where does your heart go? But if we are rooted in the inner life of God, that will also form us. Isn't that where we need to be? Just 
practicing the presence of God and just seeking and maintaining that vital spiritual love relationship with Jesus every single moment of our lives. If we are rooted in the inner life of God, it will slowly produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Where's your emotional home? Where do you return in the quiet moments? Where are you abiding? Where are you abiding? And what would it look like to make your home in God? What would you have to do different to make your home in God? To turn God and his presence moment by moment into this new lifestyle where I'm I'm taking off the old and I'm putting on this new person. I'm setting my my mind and my heart on things above. I love how A.W. Tozer said it. He said, I'm setting the direction of my heart toward Jesus. Every single day when I wake up, that's what I'm doing. Setting the direction of my heart toward Jesus. Show me your habits and I will show you who you're going to become. So we need new spiritual habits, don't we? We need need new spiritual habits. We need things like silence and solitude and praying and fasting and and slowing down and time in the Word. Not, Not just a quiet time, time to actually commune with the author of the Word. Discover who he is, the truth that he has for our lives. Those new habits are going to keep us connected, connected to the vine. If my issue is self-centeredness, if, if selfishness is my thing, if, if it's always got to be about me, about my way, I might need to start training in service. The the discipline of service. Why? Because service takes me beyond me to others, right? It's not about me anymore. It's about others. So I'm training myself in this area. If it's materialism, maybe I need to train in generosity, develop the habit of generosity. If I'm too rushed, I need to develop the spiritual habit of, of slowing down, of solitude, silence, rest and prayer. If I'm, if I'm negative all the time and just critical, maybe I need to take a 30-day negativity fast. I, I said that uh, about a year and a half ago, and a couple of people came up to the service after, and I was like, do you really have that 30-day fast? And I said, yes, I do. I'll make you a copy. 30-day negativity fast. If it's lust, maybe I need to train in this area, get with some other guys, read every man's battle, every young man's battle. See, I I can't fix myself, but through these new habits, I'm putting myself in a position to hear from God, to hear his voice, and to really train in these areas. I shared this last year about our brains, this idea of neuroplasticity. And I actually was, was talking to a guy not too long ago, and he, he actually remembered me talking about this in the sermon. This idea about our brain is constantly making all these connections called neural pathways. In other words, once you think a thought, it's actually easier to think that thought again, right? Because I've got this pathway already set up in my brain. You form this thought, this path that makes it easier to continue to think those thoughts. Now, that's good news if your thoughts are healthy, And that's really bad news if your thoughts are unhealthy, right? Because the paths are set in my mind, in my brain. If I'm addicted, if I'm struggling with alcohol or pornography, this can be really bad news. I shared this illustration. If I walked across a certain area in my front yard for 100 days straight, right? Uh, And I have to confess, I would love to have a nice green lawn, but I don't. I've got green weeds. But if I walked across those green weeds in my yard for a hundred days straight over to every day, what would I do? What would happen to that area in my yard? 
I would form a path, wouldn't I? Y'all have seen that before. You, you, form, you would form a path in our yard. That actually happened by our, by our driveway. Meredith parked our van right next to our yard. And every morning, our girls would go out and, and, and get ready for school and go out to the van. And they would have to walk over that area of our yard to get in the van. So guess what this little area of our yard looked like? A little bald patch, right? Like the back of my head. A little bald patch. Okay, so now let's think about our minds. If I think on a lie, right, if I've got these false beliefs, these wrong thoughts going through my head for a hundred days straight, what happens? I start to believe the lie and I create a neural pathway through my brain. My brain automatically just starts believing that lie automatically because I've got a pathway. So with God's help, what we're going to do is renew our minds. We're going to stay off that old path. And if I can stay off that old path for 100 days, what happens? It happened next to our driveway. Because here's what happened. Meredith decided, here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to park the van right here next to the grass. I'm going to park the van on the other side of the driveway. And I'll let you, Don, park your car here because you can walk along the driveway and get in your car without stepping on that area. What do you think happened to that area after about three months? The grass grew back. Yeah. The grass, well, sorry, the weeds. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly, for that reminder. The weeds, the, the nice green weeds that make us look like we have a lawn, they grew back. They grew back. I begin to forge a new pathway in my brain if I can stay off that old path, right? I just got to stay off of it. And I've got to forge a new pathway towards the truth because the truth is going to set me free. Paul said it this way in Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind your thoughts by feeding your spirit instead of the flesh. And here's the thing. We need help to do this, don't we? We can't do this by ourselves. We need somebody to do this with us. So you need to pick a trusted and respected friend or group that you can walk with, that you can be accountable with, that you can confess and encourage. That's why we have our discipleship groups here at Springdale. Because Jesus didn't call us to do it yourself, Christianity. He gave us each other. Here's just another truth. You become like the people you spend the most time with. So who are you spending your time with? Are they? See, there's a difference between, I hate to say this, there's a difference between Christians and people who are pursuing Christ. We've had this conversation with my young boys. You know, well, you know, Dad, you know, we're hanging out with those people, but, and, and they're Christians. And I was like, Okay, but are they pursuing Christ? Are they truly pursuing Christ? Because the people who you spend the most time with, that's who you're going to start to look like. So we got to get around people who are pursuing Christ. Who are spending time with him, who are living like him. So what are we going to do today? Are we going to decide are we going to commit? We're going to begin to train with Jesus in the classroom of life. Let me pray for you today.